Uh, today I'm pleased to welcome Professor Steve Ferry. He is our distinguished energy law scholar here this summer. He is normally at Suffolk University in Boston where he is a professor. Um, he's also been a visiting professor of law at Harvard Law School. And since 1993, he's been a primary legal advisor to the World Bank and to the UN on renewable energy projects in developing countries, uh, primarily in Asia and Africa. He is the author of seven books and 100 articles on energy and environmental law. And in addition to his JD and master's degree in urban and regional environmental design from UC Berkeley, he has a BA in economics from Pomona College in California. He was a Fulbright Fellow in London, um, and today he's going to be talking to us about the uh, U.S. Constitution, and the topic of his talk is, will the U.S. Constitution inhibit the transition to sustainable energy that many states are implementing? Please join me in welcoming Professor Perry. All right, thank you very much, uh, Scanlon. It's my uh, pleasure to be here. This is a great uh, treat for me to uh, be here. I was up here for a week, about a month ago, and around this week, and uh, um, it's just a great experience for me, so I appreciate it, and thank you very much. Um, I'm gonna do a couple of things today. I've got 69 slides, so if you blink, uh, we're in trouble here in the next 35 minutes. Um, fortunately, most of them are pictures. We're gonna light up the map as to what problems states have been having trying to regulate energy. So what I'm going to do is spend about the first 10 minutes going over the types of state incentives there have been for renewable energy. A lot of states are doing this and the states are carrying most of the load compared to the federal government. Then I want to switch over to the law. I want to take the supremacy clause of the Constitution, quickly remind ourselves when we get there what that is, and then the commerce clause of the Constitution and look just at constitutional suits against states attempting to regulate energy. The recent suits are against renewable energy. We're gonna also highlight some older suits, a few older suits, um, that were <coughs> other forms of energy, but for the same principle. And then at the end, I've got a few kind of miscellaneous uh, things about renewable energy, and then I wanna take some questions, if there are questions. So let me, uh, let's move through this uh, now. Okay, so uh, this is something you've probably seen before. The red line is where the ice cap was in 1979. The actual photograph of where the ice cap is is 2005. So there's a really important reason that states or somebody in the U.S. needs to start looking and helping renewable energy. The major sources that we're doing, we all know this, are wind power. Uh, and here is where the wind power is being most developed in the United States. Um, okay, just for informational purposes. Uh, wind power development is ramping way, way up, uh, but it's being incentivized significantly by certain state incentives that we'll come back to, as well as some federal tax incentives. Um, this is a large solar field in California. It's not the conventional flat panel uh, model. This is a centralized power uh, array. It's up and operating now. Uh, and one unfortunate aspect of this is frying all the birds that fly through it. The birds are attracted by the sun. There's so much heat. But these are all mirrors. And the mirrors reflect all the beams up to the tower on the left there. Uh, tremendous amount of heat being reflected, right? And it instantaneously boils water. Uh, so birds have had trouble with this. But this is a large solar array. We're talking about small solar arrays. Solar is ramping up right now even faster than wind. Here's where the solar is going. The interesting aspect of this chart to me is a lot of solar is going to places where there isn't as much solar. And that's because of the incentives. So Vermont is colored in, uh, Massachusetts is colored in. Those are places that are not as solarized, perhaps, that don't have as much solar insulation, uh, you know, radiation, as uh, some of the South. This is a Massachusetts chart. Solar is ramping up faster now in Massachusetts than any other state, largely because of the state incentives. Here's another depiction of where the solar is going. The bigger the circle, the more solar. Again, Massachusetts, uh, this chart's a, a year out of date. Massachusetts has now gone from, what is it, it's probably got 300 megawatts up there. Uh, Massachusetts is now at 700 megawatts. It's doubled in a year. The reason that's happening is not because Massachusetts and New England have the 
the greatest amount of solar energy. It's because of the subsidies. So subsidies are driving these technologies. California has a lot. That would be expected. It's a big state. But Massachusetts is now in second, second place. We can talk some more about that. So states are using five techniques to do this. And to some degree, we're going to raise the question of whether states can do it the way they, they can do it. There is going to be some good news at the end of this, uh, in that I'm going to suggest a way that the states can avoid all of these legal challenges. Um, but states can only do certain things in certain ways, and a lot of states have not done it that way. They're getting sued, and they've lost every one of the 20 suits that I will quickly uh, tick off for you in a few minutes, except for one. Okay, so the states have lost a lot more than they've won. Okay, so the five techniques, and I'll get this this way. Okay, let me just get them all on here. The five techniques are states have used feed-in tariffs. California had it. I'm going to highlight California losing a case as to whether it can do it. Some people argue Vermont has a feed-in tariff. Maine has one, has not been sued on it yet. We're going to argue a feed-in tariff is where you deliberately pay more than the value of wholesale power for the power because you want to incentivize it. So in New England, wholesale power for about the last six years has been averaging, in round numbers, five cents a kilowatt hour to sell it wholesale. Um, there are some states that have tried to say, we'll pay 30 cents for a particular kind of power, whether that's wind or, or something else. That's more than the power technically is worth because you want the benefits of it. You can ask the question whether that's legal in the United States. Feed-in tariffs are the most prominent and most used way around the world to incentivize renewables right now. There are a lot of, I do a lot of work overseas, as, as Dean Scanlon said, and over there we often implement feed-in tariffs to try to pull wind into a largely coal-fired system in, in developing countries or pull solar. System benefit charges, I don't want to talk too much about that. Those are basically payments by the state to certain technologies. 30% um, of the states have those. 30% of our 50 states have that. Uh, net metering I'm going to talk a lot about because that is the most prominent type of state subsidy. Uh, 43 states have it, which is 85% of the states. Okay? And that's basically when the meter turns backwards. I'll say a few more words about that. When you put power out from, for example, your solar collector, the meter goes in reverse. You get credit for it, as opposed to when you buy power, the meter goes in its normal direction. Um, carbon regulation, 10 states have that, including the East, nine East Coast states and California. Um, I'm going to talk a little bit less about that. And then renewable portfolio standards is the second most prominent state incentive. Uh, 29 states have it. That's more than 60% of the states. And that's basically where there's a credit established if you produce the specified type of renewable power. And the utilities and or, depending on the state, others who are allowed to sell power to you and me and other businesses have to buy a certain quantity of those every year. And if they fall short, they pay very stiff penalties to the state. Okay? So it has nothing to do with the sale of power per se. It's a separate electronic credit that is created. And the you get it for producing renewable power. And different states will define renewable power differently. Let me come back to that in a second. So let me see. Let's move. There it is. Okay. okay. So net metering, again, I'll show you these uh, charts that some of you may have seen these before. Net metering, 43 states. It's all the typical states you would think about being most out front on renewable energy. Net metering typically only applies by state definition, programs are different in every state, to renewable power. Some states call renewable power coal-fired power. Massachusetts, if you gasify coal and turn it into a gas, which are called manufactured gas plants during World War II and are some of the worst environmental pollution around from that. Massachusetts calls that a renewable energy, as does West Virginia call coal a renewable energy. So it's up to state legislators as to what they do. And we keep moving on this. Um, okay, so 43 states in the US, a lot of other countries do net metering, not as many as do these premium feed-in tariffs. Um, uh, let me just go to the bottom of this slide and say, let me tell, just say one thing about net metering. In most states, of these 43 states, you can only net meter for your meter, which means if you send power back off your solar collectors, it credits only your bill for that account at that building. Nine states allow you to, tr to transfer it 
to another account or another building owned by the same company or the same person. So Home Depot could have solar collectors in one of these nine other states on one rooftop, and if it had surplus generation there, a surplus credit because it was sending power back, it could transfer it to the Home Depot down the street, right? So you can move it around. Massachusetts has gone a whole um, level beyond that, and other states are now starting to, to uh, follow Massachusetts. Massachusetts makes the credit totally transferable for net metering to anybody else who's a customer of the utility. And I do a fair bit of work in Massachusetts with, with solar developers, and what we do is it becomes a gift card to the utility. So if we net meter a project, we will put two megawatts of solar panels uh, in a field, right? We will have an account because we will put a light bulb right next there if anybody has to read the operation manual at night. So we're barely a customer. You then have all these net metered credits, which are going to be at the retail rate. We don't get five cents a kilowatt hour, the wholesale rate. We get essentially the retail rate. My retail rate in Massachusetts is 25 cents a kilowatt hour for Boston Edison, which is pretty high. That's what, that's what it is right now. So you get, if, if, if I net metered, I'd get 25 cents a kilowatt hour for something that otherwise is bought and sold wholesale for a nickel. So it's a good deal. It's a good deal. I can take that credit, or if I have a field of uh, 10,000 solar panels, elbow to elbow, I can take that credit in Massachusetts, and that's mainly what it is, is large fields of solar projects, and sell that to anybody. Typically, the lawyers sell these credits in Massachusetts for somewhere between 80 and 95 cents on the dollar. We do a contract, we say, Home Depot, would you like a credit to your utility, Boston Edison, National Grid, wherever your utility supplier is. It's good for life. We'll give you the ability on four months notice to break the contract at any time, because Massachusetts lets you switch who the credit is transferred to twice a year. So we're okay, as long as we don't let somebody do it more than twice a year. And we basically give them a gift card to the utility, created off our system, um, they can get out of the contract and we give them a gift card at a discount. And the user looks and says, this is a good deal. I've got a gift card to something I'm always going to need, electricity. And I'm getting it at a, at a, you know, a fair price, however you negotiate that. So that, that's probably more than you wanted to know about net metering. Here are the feed-in countries in the world. It looks like there are a lot because North America is hatched. Hatched means in a few Canadian provinces or states it is allowed. I'm going to tell you in a few minutes that it's unconstitutional to do this in the U.S. if it is done by state order. But Maine did it, California did it, we're going to talk about the California case. California is not allowed to do it anymore because of federal court, or excuse me, a FERC, Federal Energy Regulatory Commission decision. But there, this is the main way that, that in developing countries in the world and in Europe, we incentivize solar. We pay a premium feed-in tariff price. Okay? So we keep moving. Renewable portfolio standards, 29 states. So I get through this introductory stuff fairly quickly. Every state is different as to what they define as renewable. Again, it creates a credit. Utilities and or other retailers, if they're allowed to retail power to anybody else, have to buy these credits for a big, um, it's called an alter alternative compliance payment. It's basically a fine that's just paid to the state. Okay, so every state different system, you know, whether coal's eligible, wind, solar, um, how many of these credits you have to create it usually goes up each year. Um, there are a number of states that have something called a solar carve-out or distributed generation solar. So you not only have to have renewables generally, hydro, wind, however that's defined, but you have to have also a subcategory of those that are just solar. Um, the solar penalty in Massachusetts right now, if the utility can't buy enough solar uh, renewable energy credits, is 55 cents a kilowatt hour. So if the power is worth a nickel and the utility can't buy enough or produce enough of these credits, it pays 10 times that amount as a penalty to the state. Which means that if, if I were involved as a lawyer doing a solar project in Massachusetts, I can sell those credits for generally not the 55 cents, but I can sell them generally now for about 30 cents a kilowatt hour. So I've just quintupled the value of my power I can sell the power separately for a nickel or net meter it for 15 cents. And separately from that, I also get a renewable energy credit that's worth, let's say, 30 cents a kilowatt hour. So this is the main cash flow for a lot of, this is the reason Massachusetts is in the number two position 
because they require a certain percentage of renewable and solar credits, and they're trading at a high price because the penalty price is high. And whenever there gets to be too much solar, we have a formula. Do I have it in here? No, maybe not. I think it's a later slide. I don't want to take too much more time with this. But here's the issue that's going to come up legally. Um, of the 29 states that have renewable portfolio standards, 22 of the 29 discriminate in favor of in-state power. And we're going to ask the question as to whether that is legal under the Constitution. And this is all in an article that I can give you a reference to if people read this later. 27% um, of these 29 states have in-state multipliers. So you get one renewable energy credit per unit of power if it's from outside the state, and two or three credits per unit of power if it's in the state, right? So there's a preference because states want the jobs, states want the, the, the tax, you know, want the unit in there to tax it, et cetera, et cetera. It, it's completely understandable. Others have, um, you know, um, multipliers, preferences, um, in region requirements, so there's some kind of geographic discrimination that often tends to favor the state. You have to use in-state labor, etc. So 22 of the 29 states have something very minor or more significant that's discriminatory. And this is going to be the reason that the Commerce Clause of the Constitution is going to be invoked in a few minutes. The Commerce Clause of the Constitution says interstate power is regulated by the federal government because as of 225 years ago, we're a nation, not a set of colonies. Makes sense, right? The Dormant Commerce Clause, which is where the Supreme Court has filled in and interpreted the Commerce Clause uh, over the last, uh, particularly 75 years, says no state can discriminate against interstate commerce because we're a nation, we're not a group of colonies, right? So you, got, you, can't, you can't favor your own commerce from inside your own state and try to put up something at the border in terms of a tax, a fee, or something else at the border. Okay. So 7 of 29 I have no geographic preference, bottom of this slide. 22 have some slight or greater preference. The question is that, does that violate the Dormant Commerce Clause? Okay. Whoops. That's not good. Here we go. Um, okay. So at the end of this, here's the question for all of you. What happens if we have a surplus price for some kind of power, whether that's coal or renewables? I'm going to ask you who ends up paying for that. The utility has to pay more than the going rate for certain kinds of power, maybe perhaps renewables. If we have a renewable energy uh, credit that is worth an additional fee that the utility has to buy, does the utility lose money doing that? It's going to be the question. And the last question is if we net meter, so the utility has to basically take power not at the five cent per kilowatt hour wholesale rate, but at the retail rate, mine is 25 cents a kilowatt hour, an industrial user in Massachusetts is probably 15 cents a kilowatt hour now. Does the utility lose money? The utility initially pays more than, than the going rate. Does the utility absorb that? Ratepayers. Ratepayers, good. Okay. So all of this is considered a regulatory mandate. It's considered a regulatory asset, and there's automatic pass through in every state. So ultimately, it's in everybody else's bill. It's moving here. Um, price of electricity is high in certain places. There is no reason it should be high in California. California has some of the cheapest power. It has a lot of hydro, which is very cheap. It has some nuclear, which has turned out to be cheaper than people thought as these units have gotten older and people have bought them from the utilities at sort of depressed prices. And um, Vermont also has some hydro and some nuclear. So you know, both Vermont and California have things that are sort of in the lower in the pecking order. California also has a lot of natural gas, which is a historically firing power plants, which is historically at low prices now. But they've got the highest uh, prices in the country. It's largely because of some of these cross subsidies. The utility doesn't incur this, the rates go up to do this, okay? So again, I'm fine with that. The question is what are the courts saying? There's the Supreme Court. We're going to go into the court section. So a little more introduction of how the states are doing it. Now I'm going to show you, and again, the, the, the court cases are in some articles. I'm not going, I'll give you the articles if you need them. Don't try to memorize these cases. I'm just going to light up a map of the country and show you where this has been challenged and what the outcome is. Okay. So first concept is that we have an integrated grid. Power moves at the speed of light, almost the speed of light, wherever it wants to go. Whenever we flow a switch, power is coming to it. Uh, speed of light is about seven and a half times around the Earth per second. So this stuff's moving fast. And the Supreme Court, well, and we have two parts of the grid. There's the western interconnection, the eastern interconnection. There's some transfer of power in that division right down the middle of the country. 
Texas, Hawaii, and Alaska, or part of Texas, Hawaii, and Alaska, are the only states that do not engage in interstate power. Alaska because it's far away, Hawaii because it's an island, and Texas because it's proud and free. Right? So they have disconnected. So these issues that I'm raising do not apply to those three states, or at least it's, and as you can see, it's not all of Texas. It's just the kind of more populated part of Texas. Um, let's see. Um, if you make a bad law, an unconstitutional law, you've got two problems. California, in its first carbon regulation, was sued by a group of uh, association of irritated residents. It delayed the entire carbon control program by over a year because it was found not on constitutional grounds, but on state grounds to be illegal. So there's that problem. The second thing is the cost. Um, in a case in Vermont that I'll highlight quickly in a minute, the uh, Vermont lost a case defending its regulation of a particular plant here and was told that since it was unconstitutional action that it took, the plaintiffs who sued got their legal fees. They asked the plaintiffs, what have you spent? And they said, so far, just in the trial court, $4.3 million. So everybody in Vermont was told to pay collectively $4.3 million. Vermont took the appeal to the Second Circuit, lost in the Second Circuit, and I assume the fees went up. Right? Mm -hmm. So there's a cost to rate payers. I don't know what is that, 20 or 25, 4, 4 million dollars in Vermont is probably 25 dollars per person, something like that. Or, or it's not in, so you don't want to make this mistake. And there are ways to get around it. And, and uh, okay, um, last comment here before I start showing you the cases is power moves in interstate commerce. This is where power comes in from California. California is getting power from all of the pink-colored states. That's at least 10 or more states, if you count them, or parts of 10 or more states. It's also getting power to and from Mexico, also getting power coming down to and from Canada. So power is in interstate commerce. Not only does it move very quickly, but as a practical matter, it moves quickly. Um, let me go over the deregulation slide here. Uh, there are 13 states that are the dark green states that have deregulated. It's probably not really important for what we're doing. Um, okay, um, so I'm going to now show you in quick succession, I'm going to light this map up in different colors based on where states have been challenged and whether they've lost or won. Um, first case is 30 plus years ago, 1982, a Supreme Court case. Um, in this case, New Hampshire looked around and said, we've got some hydropower and it's cheap and we want our ratepayers to get the cheap power. The utility, which is now called National Grid, then is called New England Electric System, um, operated a small operation uh, called Granite State Power, small utility in New Hampshire. It operated a big utility, the biggest utility in Massachusetts, called Mass Electric, and it operated all of Rhode Island, something called Narragansett Electric. And so it tended to blend all the power from all its power plants and spread them around. And New Hampshire said, we've got the rivers, we want the cheap stuff. Um, I've lit this yellow, because yellow is when it is held to both violate the Commerce Clause of the Constitution and, and the, uh, and the uh, Supremacy Clause. It has violated the Supremacy Clause, I haven't mentioned it yet, but because the Federal Power Act and the Supremacy Clause of the Constitution, Federal Power Act of 1935, created what the Congress, or what the uh, courts, Supreme Court has held to call the bright line. Federal government regulates all the wholesale and transmission terms and fees. The states get the retail fees and the distribution, the local distribution of power. The uh, Supreme Court has had four cases in the last 25 years, roughly 25, 30 years, 29 years to be precise, four cases in the last 29 years, and it said each time, this is a bright line, there are no exceptions for any reason to this. There's a bright line, federal government cannot go retail, states cannot regulate wholesale. This is a wholesale transaction. This utility is taking power produced in three states, averaging it together, and then selling it from the entity that owns this power, which is a sister entity called New England Power at the time, to the three utilities in these three states. It violates the preemption supremacy clause because the states are crossing over and regulating wholesale power sales, which are 100% federally controlled, no exceptions for any dire reason or anything else. We will not entertain any exceptions for any reason. It was also um, considered to be a, a dormant commerce clause violation because you're treating your in-state power differently and trying to restrict its ability to flow interstate in kind of national commerce. 
Okay, second case, Ferg versus Mississippi. I think I've got a quotation from this a second ago. U.S. Supreme Court, so two U.S. Supreme Court cases. Same year, I'm starting early and coming forward. Um, I just basically, and this is a different color here, uh, because I wanted to illustrate the Commerce Clause concept from this. So green is Commerce Clause, yellow is both Commerce and um, Supremacy Clause. And uh, the red color that's going to come up in a minute is going to be Commerce Clause only. Um, where's my quotation? My quotation is in here. Well, maybe it's later. Okay. So anyway, they, um, let me see if I've got that in a couple of slides here. Maybe it slipped out of order. Uh, let me come back to what they held. They basically, let's see if it comes up in a second. So let me, let me just keep going. California gets sued in 1994 and 1995. This is red uh, because this is, um, uh, this is the preemption clause. California in one case tried to increase by 50% the price it paid for wholesale renewable power to try to incentivize more people to do renewable power. Right? Makes sense. In another case, California tried to cut below the wholesale cost the cost for certain renewable power from certain projects it didn't like. One of these went to the Federal Energy Regulatory Commission, which never makes a decision that something's unconstitutional because it's not a court, but it's happened to say it's illegal. And the other one goes to the Ninth Circuit, which controls the kind of whole 11 states in the western part of the country, it's the level right below the Supreme Court. Both of these were stricken as violations of the Supremacy Clause to try to adjust the price either up or down for renewable or any other kind of power. The federal government can do it. It's not a bad idea to do it, but the states can't do it. So California was stricken on both of these cases. Let me keep going and see if my quotation comes up here. Uh, Wyoming versus Oklahoma. Uh, again, this is a uh, Commerce Clause case, so it's colored green again. It's uh, 1992, so we're coming a little more forward here. Um, they tried to provide incentives to use in-state energy. You cannot harbor your own energy any more than New Hampshire could harbor the electricity made from low-cost hydro. You can't try to use your own coal. You've got to let it flow in interstate commerce. You cannot favor it. Now think again, we mentioned that 22 of the 29 states are favoring in-state power for renewable energy credits, which is somewhat of the issue. Um, Okay, so um, the Connecticut decision here in 1995 is interesting. It's not one I've otherwise highlighted on my map, but probably should have. Um, they said something that will shock every lawyer who, if he or she is practicing, has a malpractice insurance policy. They say you take your client into one of these contracts where you raise the price or rely on a higher price for your client's power. And surprise, if we get the case a year later, the contract is void ab initio, which means it was void from the minute you signed it. You don't even get grandfathered for the two or three or five years till somebody sues. That's a big problem for your malpractice insurance premiums, right? Because you're probably going to get sued saying, why did you let me do this? There's case law out there. This is largely overlooked in terms of the law. Four Supreme Court decisions that I mentioned said that the filed rate doctrine, the supremacy clause, the most recent case, 2008, uh, down here, is a uh, case involving the California energy crisis. It is, uh, 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 you know, it's, it's reported as a uh, public supremacy clause. Okay, go to a case that's more current now. 2010, Massachusetts. Massachusetts tries to give uh, renewable energy credits, uh, solar renewable energy credits, only to in-state power. They also try to give contracts with the utilities to buy power at perhaps more generous prices to only in-state projects. Uh, that included Cape Wind, which has since sort of fallen apart, and it included um, three wind projects in Massachusetts. Trans Canada, which had a almost completed 170 megawatt wind farm in Maine, sued in federal court and said, you are giving these renewable energy credits to in-state power, but you're barring us in Maine. And we want to transact this power in Massachusetts. The transmission line's there. We've bought transmission capability. This power is coming your way. We think we should get renewable energy credits. Massachusetts quickly settled this case and took at least part of that in-state discrimination out. They actually settled it before they even filed a brief. They got a continuance on the brief and immediately started negotiating. So the states seem to recognize this is a problem. I call that a victory for the plaintiffs. It didn't, you know, it ended up getting settled, but the law had to be changed. We keep moving here. 
Alliance for Clean Coal, again, this is, um, these are the Midwestern states that I just uh, colored in here. Um, the Midwestern states um, uh, try to give incentives to their in-state plants to modify them so they could use high sulfur eastern local coal as opposed to lower sulfur Wyoming coal. Uh, this turns out to be a violation of the Commerce Clause because you're treating in-state fuel differently, even though you're doing it with a little, you know, you're not doing it quite as directly. You're kind of running it through environmental stuff. So even indirect stuff is getting stricken here. There's not a, one of these cases that the state has won again. Notice that. Um, okay. Um, this is the Vermont case. Uh, goes to the Second Circuit in 2013. This involved nuclear power, not renewable power. But Vermont uh, applied some restrictions on the relicensing. Uh, the interesting question is whether that was in state authority to do because the Federal Nuclear Regulatory Commission was involved. The trial court here in Vermont, there were three claims, two violations of the Supremacy Clause by trying to constrict the flow of power and, and not allow the reactor to continue unless the power was sold at a discounted price here in Vermont was the allegation. Um, one Commerce Clause violation, trying to treat in-state power differently than interstate power. This is a privately owned reactor that's been sold by the utilities at the urging of the uh, commission here to the highest bidder, which is the company Energy. So Energy versus Shumlin, the uh, current governor. And so two, uh, two preemption clause, supremacy clause violations, one Commerce Clause violation. The lower court found, the trial court, the federal trial court, found one of the, it found the Commerce Clause claim, as I recall, to not be right, which means it hadn't quite matured. They sued before they signed the contract, and they said, well, you should have taken one more step and signed the contract, watch your company go bankrupt, and then sue, right? And so they said, no, no, we wanted to be proactive. It went up to the Second Circuit. It was still found on one of the two Supremacy Clause claims to be unconstitutional state regulation. The second one was also found not to be right, which means you had to sign the contract um, which the company claimed would, would be would be bankruptcy for it. I don't know whether it would have. And so two of the claims were kicked out as you, you know you sued you know a month or two too early, and not that there you wouldn't have won, but you just sued too early. So again, um, that's colored both colors because at least at the trial court, supremacy clause violation and a maybe it was, maybe it was the commerce clause violation. Was the other one that's okay. I think that's right. Okay, uh, Illinois Commerce Commission, interesting uh, decision 2013, so in the present tense. Um, this involved transmission infrastructure and payment, but in uh, sort of an aside, the court, this is the Seventh Circuit, this is Judge Posner, who's probably the, one of the best known, probably the best known federal appellate court judge outside the Supreme Court, right, the federal appellate court judges. Unanimous opinion of the panel of the Seventh Circuit. Michigan made a claim saying we don't want uh, to pay for transmission lines to bring wind power into Chicago and, uh, you know, uh, uh, Michigan and uh, Detroit, Detroit and Chicago. And Michigan actually volunteered, said, because we don't give renewable energy credits to out-of-state power, therefore why should we have to pay for it? We don't recognize it. But they used it because this stuff is going at the speed of light wherever anybody throws a switch. Uh, Judge Posner and the and the appellate circuit in that case, it's somewhat of an aside, but said it's nice that you raised that, but that's not going to salvage you because that is clearly unconstitutional under the Commerce Clause to discriminate and give renewable energy credits only to your in-state power and not to out-of-state power. That was not the issue in the case, so it's not exactly exactly on point. He said, since you raised it in Michigan, you just raised an unconstitutional argument. That's the only appellate court uh, so far, I think. And somebody mentioned there may have been a decision yesterday. At least before yesterday, the only uh, uh, court that, at the appellate level, the local Supreme Court, that's reached, reached the question as to whether that's permissible or not permissible to discriminate. Uh, those 22 of the 29 renewable portfolio standard states discriminate in some way for instant power. So we keep these moving. Here's the one case that California's gonna lose. Now remember, this is the fourth, this is the third of four, four cases I'm gonna show you from California. California lost the first two. A case comes up again uh, in the last year or so in California. This is not electricity, this is liquid fuels. This is the ethanol in your gasoline. When you fill up a gasoline pump, it often says 10% of this pump is ethanol. That's corn-derived 
you know, burnable hydrocarbons as opposed to oil-derived hydrocarbons. The lower court in this case said clearly unconstitutional to discriminate against out-of-state ethanol coming in. And uh, the federal judge said that's clearly a violation of the Commerce Clause, and I'll set aside, since if it's illegal, it's illegal, I'll set aside reaching the preemption clause, the uh, supremacy clause. Um, let's see if I can a slide on this. Yeah, okay, so the majority says, um, well, let me roll back a step. The lower court says this is facial discrimination. You discriminate, even though you've done it very cleverly, by not saying it's our state versus your state, but you created zones. And the farther the ethanol had to come, a lot of this comes from the Midwest because that's where the coal is, they said we're going to give credits in two ways. The further it comes by truck, since we're trying to stop global warming, which is CO2, the further it comes by truck, the more oil is burned and the more CO2 you're putting into the air. So you get a discredit for that. And that's fair enough, right? That's, that's science. The second thing they said is the Midwest has a lot of coal-fired power. We in California use hydro and nuclear and gas, which is much lower in CO2. Therefore, because you're producing this in an area that happens to have a lot of coal-fired power, we're going to give you a disbenefit or a discredit in this crediting system because you're putting more CO2 in the air in the production process. You use a lot of electricity to take the corn and turn it into liquid fuel. So, and that's fair too, right? That's good science. The lower court said that's really a clever way to do it. You're not saying our state versus your state using distance traveled and what the energy mix is where you are, but it has the effect of discriminating against out-of-state commerce and helping in-state commerce. Unconstitutional and we'll, after you brief it, we'll reach the supremacy clause question, but it's a violation of the commerce clause. The majority, it goes up to a three-judge panel in the Ninth Circuit. This is the only case out of the 20 that the states have won uh, as of uh, when I made these slides. And um, the majority switches and says, we're well, going to take a different test, not what's called strict scrutiny, for those of you who have, uh, have studied that in law school. We're not going to use strict scrutiny. We're going to use the Pike balancing test, and the state often wins under the Pike versus Bruce balancing test which means it's not per se illegal, it can be, it can be looked at. So um, long story short, two judges out of the three on the, on the court have, uh, come up with a different test and they say, yeah, it's discriminatory, but it's not really the intent of this, and it's just kind of, you know, if for, for in, in the interest of science, you can discriminate, basically, is what they say. Okay. And there is more CO2 if you have to ship this from the Midwest. Um, there's a vigorous dissent uh, in that case, saying you guys aren't right about this. So we have two judges, the lower court judge and the dissenting judge on the Court of Appeals, and two, two judges on saying, no, this is unconstitutional. Two other judges, which happen to be the two out of three at the appellate level, which is the final court, saying it's okay if we apply a different test. So that's a two-to-two -two standoff. So even on that, which is not electricity, it's at least somewhat unclear and shows you that the courts are, are somewhat confused as to whether this is or isn't okay. Let me go a few more of these and uh, leave some time for questions. Uh, recent case in North Dakota, this is going up on appeal. North Dakota tried to stop the importation of coal-fired power from North Dakota next door to it, uh, and also not allow any new coal-fired power plants in the state, uh, with some exceptions. And that was found, again, to discriminate against interstate commerce, was held unconstitutional. That's going up on appeal. I don't know if there's much hope for it on appeal, but we'll see. Um, what else have I got? Um, Here's a Colorado case suing on renewable energy credits in Colorado. Colorado, in response to that, took out its in-state preferences, which made it more palatable, right? Um, again, that's more or less, I suppose, a victory for the people who challenged it on that ground. So um, let me skip over this. Well, let me not skip over to it. Um, we have these big colored blobs out here called independent system operators that, with FERC authority, manage all the transmission of power and all the wholesale markets every day trading this power at wholesale in these areas. The biggest one in the country is PJM. It's not geographically the biggest, but it is the uh, biggest in terms of uh, the number of people. So that's the biggest one. The most advanced are the ISO New England one that we're in and the PJM. Uh, so they're considered the two most sophisticated ones. Um, two suits I'll mention and then uh, try to conclude here and leave some time for questions. Um, two almost identical suits, one in New Jersey. New Jersey said, we want the power located not in that larger uh, area that we have. We don't want it all located in Ohio, where it may be cheaper to build the plants. We want them in our states for reasons of reliability. 
Um, so we're going to do the following. We're going to let you sell your power locally, but we will guarantee you a certain price. And to the degree that selling your power through this large uh, interstate area called PJM, which all the entities do, we will give you a certain price if you'll, gear, if you'll, if you'll agree to site inside our state. Um, the same thing happened in Maryland with almost, almost an identical situation. So I've got two states colored over here, Maryland and New Jersey. Similar thing, we'll make up the difference, we'll give you a premium price if necessary, if the region doesn't give it to you, to locate in our, re in our regions. Sued under both the Commerce Clause and the Supremacy Clause. These are the, probably the most recent decisions. Um, they lost to both of these cases on one ground. They were held again, they're saying this is indirectly affecting the bidding pattern of people who are bidding in this multi-state regional power sale in these 13 states called PJM that are collectively together. Um, federal government can do that, the state cannot do it. On the Commerce Clause, it was an interesting decision. It said it's not a violation. Commerce Clause regulates commerce. It's not a violation of that to make the, to try to incentivize them to locate in the state. You just can't restrict where they sell the power, which is the commerce that comes out of the power plant when it operates. So as long as you don't touch where they can sell it and try to hold it in, in state like New Hampshire did, uh, it's okay. But it's still a violation of the supremacy clause, both of these federal court cases. Therefore, they're illegal, it's stricken, you can't do it, it's unconstitutional. Both of these went up to the Third Circuit Court of Appeals and the Fourth Circuit Court of Appeals, both of which um, held that that was the right decision. Okay, let me see if I can keep this going here. A um, couple more minutes. Um, okay, a Morgan Stanley case, U.S. Supreme Court of California, similar preemption endorsement. Um, California, as I mentioned, this is the fourth or fifth California case. So California's won one of these four or five cases. The Public Utility Commission tried to impose a feed-in tariff. They have premium price for certain co-generated power. Um, that was contested at FERC. Uh, FERC said you cannot cross the line into regulating or giving a premium price for wholesale power. That's federal only. You can't touch it. No excuses, no exceptions, no good motives. So the states have lost a lot of these. Um, so feed-in tariffs, summarized, and I'm not sure the last slide here, are generally unconstitutional if adopted in the United States by a state regulatory commission. The California decision more or less upholds that. It's a FERC decision. Um, the states have stopped trying to do that with the exception perhaps of Maine, I think the suit in Maine, again, was bounced out on not having standing to sue, I think. But, again, federal government only regulates 200 large utilities. So it doesn't affect Texas, doesn't affect Hawaii or Alaska, because they're not in interstate commerce, and it doesn't affect municipal utilities, co-ops, or other of the 3,000 public utilities out there. It does affect the roughly 200 investor-owned big utilities, which, for better or worse, serve 75% of the U.S. population. So it's a small number of people who are affected by these constitutional issues, a small number of companies, but a large number of people. Um, so again, here's what we have here, summarizing. Um, dormant Commerce Clause, first line, it, it's been ruled to be a violation in the first, uh, second, and seventh circuits. First and second are up here in the northern part of, uh, the northern part of this map, up in here, first and second circuits are up in here, uh, New York, et cetera. Uh, the seventh circuit is out here. Uh, the Ninth Circuit is um, the contrary circuit. A lot of states in the Ninth Circuit. Again, it's the only circuit that has, has done that. So when we skip over Germany and the problems with some things there. Um, so again, these slides would summarize what we've been doing as to what the Supreme Court has held and the federal circuits have held. Hopefully, we, we've got to give you a flavor for that. Let me skip over those in the interest of time. Uh, skip over all of those. Okay, so that we've seen. Um, so, Here's the interesting implication of that Rocky Mountain suit, the one that California won. There was a petition to try to have the entire panel of the Second Circuit hear it, which means not just three judges, but you get you know nine judges up there. And um, they didn't get enough votes to do that. But there were some people who wanted to hear it on the Ninth Circuit who gave very vigorous sense to that. And so um, of the Eleventh Circuit, they pointed out this is the only circuit to have made this decision. And they said, here are the implications for California. If we can restrict ethanol, I shouldn't say restrict, if we can disadvantage ethanol from coming in from the Midwest or the Rocky Mountains or wherever else it's produced, because it is true, scientifically, that there's going to be more truck CO2 going into the air, which there will, and there's more coal-fired power perhaps being used in the Midwest to do it there. 
The question is, why does it supply to everything in California? So the dissent actually looks at this. It says, for example, why should there not be a penalty on any wine brought into California? California produces plenty of wine, and if you put it on a truck or a train and ship it to California, that's more CO2. Why not that? Uh, California's been really silent on this. I guess the, que the answer is that the statute doesn't deal with wine. And so the question is also, how about trash? There are seven Supreme Court cases where states have tried to restrict trash coming in from outside the state because they don't want to be a dumping ground. In every case, that's been held unconstitutional as a violation of the Dormant Commerce Clause because you're discriminating against the same stuff, trash coming in from outside. Every state has a place for trash because every state has land. So if you can do it for ethanol, you certainly can do it for trash because every state has a place for trash. And uh, there's no real reason you have to ship it to another state except it's less expensive to ship it to Indiana or Alabama or places where they don't charge as much to take trash. And so going on, same thing for electricity. Why can't you discriminate against out-of-state electricity if it's produced with more coal? Interesting question. Um, why can't, why just the 10% ethanol additive for gasoline? Why not gasoline per se? Let's block or restrict or charge more or give fewer credits for uh, Texas refined gasoline. And finally, what the EU is now doing, let's, uh, let's charge everybody who gets on a plane in Plaza, California. Because there's more CO2 put in the air. That's scientifically okay. So that's the dissent there. Um, this is the only circuit that has done this. It does seem to be somewhat contrary to the US Supreme Court decisions. Um, so is this clear? Of course it's not, right? Okay, so anyway, that's where we are. Um, here is, I'm not gonna run out of time to talk about it. Here's an article that, that was published quite recently in the last uh, six months or so at Wake Forest. People were saying, okay, is there a way around this? So I thought for a while, and I came up with what I think is a bulletproof way for states to do the same stuff and not run into any of these constitutional problems. It's more work for the states. It's more work for the states. It's not perfect, but it'll accomplish most of these incentives that states want to do for renewables. Has any state done this yet? No. Has anybody read this? Probably not. So, in any case, there is a way around this uh, if states want to lay a better basis for this. Uh, so that's out there. Um, uh, what else do I want to show you? So uh, this is just one chart. This is uh, National Grid, which supplies not quite half the power in Massachusetts. And this is their cost projections of what net metering and the various solar and, and other generic renewable energy credits. We have four, times of renew four types of renewable energy credits you have to get in Massachusetts. They're saying that in a couple of years, this is going to be a half billion dollars a year for a utility that supplies less than half the power in a small state of Massachusetts. Um, so the utilities are trying to say this is expensive. Again, utilities don't bear this. It comes into rates. This issue is starting to become more significant. I'm not so concerned about the cost, but I do think the constitutional issue is one that is going to be somewhat of a problem with this. Let's see if anything else I want to do. Uh, no. OK, so let me stop there and take any questions that people have. <coughs> Or don't have. Yeah. <clears throat> Stephen. First of all, I want to uh, tell you how much I just really appreciate the way you pull these cases together. It's really a rare kind of presentation that lays out so clearly uh, what the directions you've seen. Okay. Uh, I've got a couple of questions. One is, can you please tell us what the bullet bulletproof solution is? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Number two, yeah. Number two if, if this is so clearly uh, uh, a pit that all of these Renewable energy programs are going to fall into. Why is it there's not a single decision that's thrown out an RPS program or a REC program? Uh, well, it's 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 there's, I, I probably skipped over a couple of slides, but um, there's been a challenge in Missouri, a challenge in Colorado, and both of them took the in-state preference out of the in, in response to the suit out of the renewable energy credits. Of course, it's not present. It's not a decision. Yeah, it's not a decision. Yeah, and so most of this stuff. Uh, there's been a tremendous amount of situations where, where the states pull it back um, and, uh, and, and and try to remove the, uh, the credits. Uh, so, so the Commerce Clause, the highest decision we have is the Seventh Circuit decision, which as we mentioned is dicta from Judge Posner and the rest of the Seventh Circuit saying, Michigan, if you want to raise this, you don't want to pay to bring the North Dakota uh, wind power in because you don't give renewable credits to out-of-state wind. Um, that's nice. But you've just, you've just admitted you have an unconstitutional pro, uh, program, even though it's not here. So what we have is dicta, because nobody's really gotten that high or challenged it. Um, you know, it's, uh, it just hasn't gotten up that high yet. Uh, you know, I don't know why it hasn't, but in the large part, because Massachusetts settled it. Yeah, Massachusetts immediately, immediately settled it. 
So um, other question is, what's the solution? Let me see if I can do that in 30 seconds. Um, if the states would move over to the retail side on any of this, it would be bulletproof. What they're doing is they're trying to regulate wholesale power. In uh, 19, last time I looked at it was 19, was it 86 or the late 80s, only 5% of power was wholesale before it was sold to you and me. Utilities basically produced their power and sold it with a little bit of stuff at the margin. Today, more than 50% of the power that moves every day is wholesale, in part because some of the utilities on the East Coast have been incentivized and in California incentivized to sell their power plants to the highest bidder. When you buy it back, that's a wholesale transaction to service, right? So what you've done is you've taken the state, the states by doing this have taken themselves, and the, perhaps are not thinking it through, have taken them steps themselves out of the regulatory role on the retail side and turned that over to FERC. And there's even a Supreme Court, uh, no, Court of Appeals decision that, um, I don't have a slide up here, that, that mentions that, saying states, did you think about what you were doing? Um, so one thing is to move over to the retail side. In every state but Massachusetts, you can do that with net metering because you can only net meter your own account. You can't sell it as a gift certificate, more or less, outside of Massachusetts, although some states in New England are now looking to emulate Massachusetts because it's a great incentive. Um, so if you move over to that, what you could do is you could price, you could say this is a tremendous benefit to have solar on your roof. And when the person buys power, you could give it away for zero, right? You could basically do it in the retail price and then pay a price coming back that reflected that. That's gonna work fine for everything except large field-mounted projects of solar. And I have to confess, those are some of the things I've been helping put up in Massachusetts, but um, in those large fields, um, it, it's not gonna help the project that is not using anything but one light bulb in that field, and is then selling all the power to get the gift certificate and then walk up the street and, and have the lawyer sell that at a, at a premium value. So it doesn't help that, but a lot of the states, including Massachusetts, are now trying to push new large projects out and concentrate net metering just to people who have it on the roof. And other states are trying to do that too. A lot of states will say you cannot net meter more than 120% of your maximum power use. So you can basically have to keep it within the zone of what you use. If you do that for 42 of the 43 states, that would be a reasonable solution to just try to discount the cost of the power when you sell power because of all the benefits of solar, for example. Yeah. Are any of the states, especially the western states with the large solar gain inputs, contemplating setting up a, uh, a mini grid of some kind within the state as a state enterprise, fueling themselves or distributing power to their own, and then turning the balance over to FERC to distribute as they see fit? Um, well, you could, in California, you can sell them to the California ISO. So if I went back to the ISO slide, there's an independent system operator in California that you can sell all your power through on, uh, on just a daily basis if you want to. Um, are, the, are the states thinking of doing that? I don't know. Steve, do you know if, any, if anything like that's happening out there, sort of a municipal or a public aggregation? I don't know. Well, uh, I'm not clear where you're going with the question. You know, there, there are uh, many choice aggregations that are creating their own generation resources. It just seems that the uh, municipal power, locally produced right. power, is immune from these attacks. It is, yes. And thus a state that has as a resource something that generates a lot of electricity and doesn't have the population that can use it could possibly set up an industry within their state on a microgrid, something outside or, uh, the, the, the national grid, and thus make it the state's business to not only give power to its residents and its, its uh, community, but then s sell or give or distribute or give the right to sell that to FERC so that they don't violate the, inter uh, co the Commerce Clause. Yeah, or, or again, in all those states that have those uh, those kind of colored blobs on the map, in the system up in sure you can, um, solar and, and wind are considered must run. They have to take it if you produce it, which is good, right? There's not going to have to block it out. And so you can immediately just toss it into the market. It'll be the first power taken, and it'll get whatever the price is that you know, a nickel or seven cents or eight cents or whatever, wherever it's fluctuating. So it exists without a market. It's already there. It's okay. already there. Yeah, you can, you can sell it. I haven't seen the states, I haven't seen any of the states trying to do this in a new way just for solar. It doesn't mean it's not happening. I'm just not aware that states are doing it. Um, we're going to have to oh, okay. end it there, but for those who have continuing questions, I'm going to stay after sure. and speak Let with Professor Ferry. But thank you for being here. Okay.